Caching is a major feature in application development. It's also a way of optimizing an application to make it run faster. Imagine a user sending a request from the front end, which will usually go through authentication, authorization, and maybe even calling multiple services before hitting the database. And then getting the data from the database and coming back through the same channel to the front end. This requires more workload on the server and also consume time by traveling through the old channel to the back end and front end. So the beauty of caching is, caching is the moment we travel to the back end to fetch data, we are going to save it in a temporary storage for the user. So the, whenever the user makes a next call, the user will always get the cache, the, the data from the cache. So that will be faster and saves time and workload for the server traveling back and forth. So today we'll be looking into local cache and distributed caching. Local caching is actually a temporary cache memory available to each server, while distributed cache is actually a global caching memory available to multiple servers, in case we are looking at microservices and all. But before we get into that, I would like us to go into, uh, go into implementation of local cache and distributed caching, and we'll actually see how this works. Let's go. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and create a new project, select .NET Core Web API, um, click on next, uh, give the project a name, I would say cache project, and I'll go on um, next. Uh, select the framework i would choose we can use dotnet core but i'll be going with the latest microsoft.net framework dotnet uh, 5 and um we can create the project now and visual studio will do its thing i mean scaffold and prepare the old project for us and we can go from there And now we have our projects all set up. And if we look into the uh, cache project, the, the project, uh, there is a startup class that comes with it. So the major difference between .NET Core, for, uh, .NET Core and .NET 5.0 is that .NET 5.0 comes with an inbuilt Swagger UI that we can use to test our code. For most of you that are familiar with .NET Core, um, we all know, um, you know the function of the startup class, but in here, uh, we have a new feature there which gives us the Swagger UI. I'm going to go ahead and run the default project just to make sure that we have it all set up and running. So this is the Swagger page now loading, uh, trying to generate the project for us. Let's just wait for that. Now this is our Swagger page giving us the project. Uh, we can see the default weather forecast controller there uh, running it. So that's just that. So um, I'll go ahead and close that. And the next thing I'll do is, uh, so looking at the startup, I'll zoom that out real quick. The startup, we have the configure, uh, we have the Swagger UI, uh, you know, the configure service where we can actually add our dependence injections and regular setup. So what I'll do next is um, I'll go ahead and create a new controller. Uh, I want to name that, um, what can I name it? Well, API controller, and I'll give that a name, uh, first controller empty give the name as first controller so now we have our first controller one thing about the controller in um dotnet 5 is uh we're using attribute routing you can see the routes on line 10 um api slash route So I'm going to go ahead and start our um, method. But before then, I would like to explain that I created a, this text file here. In the text file here, I wrote a string value. It says, hey, aliens, Jibri says hello from planet Earth, just to make sure that we don't get confused on that. So I'm not going to be creating a, dat a database in this project. We are going to pretend like the content of the file is what we have in the back end database. So the majority of um, this um, phase is to ensure that I create a method that can actually return the content of that file for me.
I'm gonna go ahead and start with the method now. I'll call that um get file. Get file create a method. Now before we proceed, I'll go ahead with the attribute routing. Um I'll give that a name. Uh get uh route get so the get is what we show in the front end uh swagger so by the time we actually execute that get method from the front end the swagger will map it uh net call will map it to this method that's the major uh function of the attribute routing and that of course the http verb is get with this i think we are all set up to go with the method now so like i said earlier the uh, the mission is to read have this method return whatever the content of that file is so i'm going to start um, writing the function to read the file system.io read all text now the read all text will ask for a parameter which is the full part of the file we are trying to read so what i'm going to do is um i'm going to go ahead and create a variable that will give us the parts um i would say uh, private string file part equal to then i'll go ahead and copy the full file part of our text file so if i copy the full file part that should um assign the value to file part then i'll copy the file part variable and assign that into the um read all text parameter so that way we have our i mean our implementation to read the text now this i will assign it to a value so i'm going to go ahead and assign this to a value uh, so that value will be what is you know reading the text i'll say file data so now our file data is supposed to give us the content of the file then i'll just return to the file data itself so with this all set up um this method should be good to give us the content of the file by calling the method. So what I will do now is I'm going to go ahead and run it uh, on the front end of the swagger. Let's see how that pans out. And now our UI is coming up. I mean the swagger UI. There we go. Now we have our UI. Uh, we have our controller showing there the first and then the method get. So I'm going to go ahead and execute this method. Uh, it should give us the content of the file. So there we have it. Uh, hey aliens, Jibril says hello from planet Earth. I'm going to zoom that so we can see that. So that's the content of the um, file. The it shows that the method is working fine. So now uh, I'll stop this and quickly explain, go through it again. So what we are trying to achieve here is the file is standing as a back end, like, okay, the last, you know, source of the information. But I want to store this information in the cache, in the local cache, so that my method will check through the cache first. Then if it's not in the cache, then you can travel to the back end to check it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, um, you know, uh, in, uh, inject the iMemory cache library in the controller here so the iMemory cache is actually a, a library inbuilt with the .NET Core framework right so it gives us the access to use the in-memory cache the in-memory cache is local to each server itself so i'm going to name that um local cache and of course i have to uh, create a constructor for the dependency injection to actually come to life real quick then i'll import the method i mean import the library in there and we can use it so basically what i'm doing here is just dependency injection and i import the library uh control period should do that So now I have the in-memory injected in the controller and what I'll do is I will just assign a variable uh, that can actually utilize the in-memory object to call the methods in the in-memory. So what I'm trying to do now, I'm trying to get, call the get method in the in-memory. Uh, the get method will require me to assign a key so it can look for the key in the cache. 
you know we have met so many methods in there we can use any of them but i'll go with the get and the get requires me to assign a key so now i'll be creating a parameter in the get file method as a string key now automatically creating a parameter the swagger ui will create a text box for us to input a key there so that's the way that works so that key will be, is what the the local cache will use to map the objects in the cache but currently we don't have anything in the cache let's just work with that for now okay uh object type okay variable type should work that out okay that's fine Yes, I think we are good now. So now the cache data will actually check the local cache. If it's not in the local cache, then it will go and fetch it from the main source itself, which is the uh, file data itself. But then, after fetching it, I wanted to set it into cache, right? So I'll just make that cache data the variable to go and fetch. So once you fetch it, then set it into the cache for me. So that way, I mean the request doesn't have to travel all the way to the back end to go and fetch it again so check the local cache if it's not there fetch it then assign the value you fetch from the back end into the um local cache so we are assigning the key and the value there so that's me setting it into the cache and then i'll just return the cache data but i still have to um add a condition um there so if i wanted to check the cache first uh, if it's not in the cache then you can go ahead and you know um fetch it from the file so i'm gonna go ahead and add a conditional statement there if the cache data is not null meaning if there's something in the cache just return it don't bother going to the back end to you know fetch anything save the trip and make the application faster so that's basically what's happening here so if the cache data is not equal to null then just return the cache data so the implementation will terminate there it only travels back when there is nothing in the cache so yes i think this setup should be good to go now sequentially and then set it in the cache and then return the cache. I'll put a debugger there and I'm gonna go ahead and run this now. Let's see how that works. And there goes our UI. Now we have a um, text box there for key because we've created a parameter for key there, right? So I'm gonna put a random key in there, uh, test key, and I'll execute that. Let's see what comes out. Uh, looks like we have an error, huh? What could that be? Let's read what the error is uh, Unable to resolve let's see Unable to resolve micro service type for Microsoft extension caching in iMemory. Okay, the reason we are actually having this issue I'm gonna go ahead and stop it is because we have to register um, the cache library in the dependency injection uh in in startup class so in dotnet core and dotnet 5 uh, before we implement any dependency injection we have to ensure that um we register it so like you see i'm doing dependency injection of i memory cache so i'm gonna go to the startup class configure service that method there is where we are going to um register any you know dependency injection um that we'll be using in the application any you know we have to register it as in in the pipeline so basically what i'm going to do now is i'm going to um register it by typing services dot add memory cache and then that's it so i've registered this in the application now the application is aware of the services i'm trying to inject which is i memory cache and now i can go ahead and utilize the i memory cache object and i'll go ahead and um run the application one more time
and there we go so i'm going to go ahead and type test key uh, execute that so that should hit the debugger so we can see it as uh, hit the debugger now and then i can go ahead and run through the application to check through to check the key you can see the key test key so step in check the cache of course it will come as null we don't have anything there so then go ahead and read the file since it's null go ahead and read the file now you've read the file then set it into cache for me we can see the value there it has set it into cache hey aliens jibril says hello from planet earth now return um the value of you know the cache so now we have the value there there you see it so now what i'll do is i'm going to go ahead and execute it again and this time around uh it should get it for me from the cache like i've executed it so it will check the cache we can see it in binary format yes then that's it so that is coming from the cache so it doesn't have to go to the back end to go and read it all again it's just return it for me from the cache right away so that is faster and that's it that we have it there so basically this is how that work um cache makes it faster it doesn't have to travel all the way to the back end so assuming that is a database uh we are trying to call then we have saved ourselves the trip of going to the back uh, to the back end to the database we just get it straight from the cache and return it that's it so pretty much that's how the local cache works um but this cache is still local to the server itself so if i'm trying to call it from external server i wouldn't have access to it so it's only local to the cache project server and that's it for the local memory cache but there's a concern here fine the project we created which is the cache project server can now access the data you know uh, without traveling to the database as far as it's kept in the cache right but what if we have another server maybe we create another project uh, maybe it's server 2 or you know any other project there and the project the, the other project is trying to call that same key that same test key will that project get that data from the cache the answer is no because the cache memory is local to the first project alone so the next project now we have to travel all the way to database or back and wherever to get the same data but we don't want that because if multiple projects or multiple servers are rushing to database back and forth, this could cause clogs in the queue and this will actually affect the performance of application, which might make it slow. But how can we now have other projects just call that same key and then we'll get the value from the cache? There might be a solution if you stick around and that will be the distributed caching. We are going to go ahead and create a distributed cache which is global and we are going to run multiple servers and multiple servers will be calling the same key and they will be getting the same data. Moving forward, I'm going to go ahead and collapse this project and create a new project. Add new project and I can name that, name that um, you know, of course it's ASP.NET Web API next. Uh, let's call it a uh, test server 2. Or just test server whatever test server 2 okay then next uh, we are using the 5.0 framework next and .NET core visual studio will do its things scaffold the project for us so here is our second project this is our second server here so in the second server what I'm gonna go ahead and do is to um, create a new controller in the second server so just right click on the controller and then add controller uh api controller uh, we want an empty controller so we can write everything from the scratch then we name that uh second controller okay so visual studio will do this thing i'm just gonna go ahead and delete the default controller there by microsoft weather forecast and i'll go ahead and do the same thing in the uh previous project as well just to be clear that we are in charge of our own controllers now collapse that and we can go from there 
So I'm, I'll try to save more time. I'll copy everything I have in the first controller and paste it in the second controller. So before we even get into distributed cache, I want to try and access this key from the second server. See if we have access to it, just to be clear on that part. So um, I'll need to import the iMemory cache into the second server itself, uh, you know, change the constructor name. And then I have to also, um, you know, clear up the uh, file details there since we don't have the file. I just want to get it from the cache. I don't need the file in the second server. I want to depend on the key. So I'll, I'll, I think I have all this set up now. So one more thing. We need to also um, set it as a startup project. So when we, when we run it, it will start the second server. And uh, let's see how that works. Oops, I totally forgot. I'm supposed to register it in the startup class. Remember the uh, problem we ran into the first time when we didn't register it. So I'm going to go ahead and register it in the second server here. Test server 2, register it as add memory cache. So that way we have all that set up. And from here now, I think we are good to go. Let's test run it, see how that goes. And we'll use the same test key to fetch the cache value, see if we get the value. So we have our second server up now. If I run that, uh, put the key here, test key, and then if I put a debugger here in the second controller, uh, get, and then execute that. So we have the key, but it's not going to be in the cache here. It will come out as null. You can see it is a null value because the cache second server cannot see it so the point here is that the key and the value is only local to cache data anything outside of this cache project cannot find it so we need something that is global distributed that both servers can actually find it in the cache that is distributed server so we can have like 50 projects here or 50 microservices and they will be running distributed cache values I mean, local, local, local server still has its own disadvantage too, um, but we'll just take it one step at the other, at a time. So what I'm going to go ahead and do is I'll go back to the first controller and I will also create a value of um, variable of uh, distributed cache, I distributed cache. Let's see if we have it there. So that's... Um, Imported, I'll just put a distributed cache. So I'm going to go ahead and inject it like we did for the iMemory cache. Then bind it together. So now we have this all set up. Uh, so let me just make sure that I differentiate that. So we have this set up now. And like we did uh, for the local, we have to register it here in the startup class. So we have to also register it to ensure that we can actually use the distributed cache. So how do we register that? Uh, there is this uh, stack, ready stack exchange cache that we, the, the service can use. So services dot add stack exchange. Ready cache. So we can't find it. So what what we are going to do is um we're gonna go ahead to the project right click on the project and go to manage nugget package so the manage nugget package is where we can actually you know install uh external libraries we are we are using redis here so for redis we'll do a redis 
Christ. Okay, so stack exchange of Redis. So I'll install that. Uh, once that is installed, save it. So it's currently installing it now, it has been installed. Now, if we go back to the startup class for the first controller, if we control dot. I'm not sure if we actually use the right um, NuGet package. Stack Exchange Redis. Okay. Oh, there should be a there should be one that is Microsoft or Stack Exchange Redis. Okay, this one here. Yes, let's install this one. Okay, that should be it. So, once this is installed, and um, then go back to the startup class. It's still installing. Let's make sure it's installed. Still installing. Okay. Accept. So this is installed. I might have to take out the previous one. There's a clash in dependency here. So I'll take out this one. Yes. So we have it all set up now. And if I go back to the startup class, I should be able to find it. Let's see. Services dot add stack exchange redis cache. There we have it. So the add stack exchange redis cache now. If you look at the parameter, it is asking for an action parameter, right? Meaning we have to make a configuration there. We have to configure something there. So how do we do this? Um, let me just create an, uh, a variable here. Options. Then the options will give me, um, you know, uh, access to actually configure my connection string for the Redis because multiple servers will be using the uh, cache memory. So we need a connection string to have all these, um, you know, tied together. So that way I can just sign it up. Dot configuration option. Configuration options. So what am I trying to pass? The connection to the connection string that I'm trying to use. So I can explicitly put the connection string here. But what I'm going to do is, um, I'm going to go ahead and set the connection string there. So the Redis connection string I'm using, um, I have my Redis server here. Uh, so if I start the Redis server here. Go ahead and start the Redis server. So the Redis server will give me the uh, port, which is six three seven nine, right? So that's the port I'll be using. Six three seven nine. The port I'll be using, and that way it will give, it will give me access to uh, the connection string itself. So I'm gonna go ahead to the app settings or JSON, and I need to configure my connection string here.
I'll just name that as Redis connection. Then the local host for my Redis server. Local host is 6379. Right. So that way I've you know variableized my local host connection string. So this is the one I'll be using henceforth. I'll close this page. So here what I will do here is to tie that Redis connection to configuration. So that way it will get the uh, Redis connection from there. So I registered that there. I mean, there are other things that we can do here, like um, the instance name, you know, a lot of things that we can do there. We can add an instance name, uh, which actually makes sure that all keys are uniquely identified but those are actually deeper but for now let's just take it one step at a time so now i've registered my distributed cache here i'll copy this same thing and do it in the second server also which is the test server so here i'll save this here so i still need to actually import uh stack exchange class library here also so all my all my servers needs to have you know the library stack exchange in it so they can actually work with um the redis so that's what i'll do here ready stack exchange stack exchange microsoft okay i'll install that So now I have it here. So I should be able to use it stack exchange. But then I also need to register the same connection string here. So look at it like server A and server B are using the same connection string. So that is what actually gives them the access uh, to, to the cache itself. So I'll copy what I did here and do the same thing in the second server. I'll go to the second server, absetting.json, and then register the same connection string there. So they can all connect to that Redis server. So that way, the way I've configured it now, so multiple servers can access that same connection string and they can all use it together. So let's go back to the controller. So for the first controller, I would, um, um, go ahead and register the distributed cache here, then get it from distributed cache instead of using the local. So I'll, I'll, I'll uh, comment out the local and then use the distributed but cache data is equal to distributed dot get, right? Get the key. So if you check the distributed data, and there's nothing there. So I'll just use get async. Since we are using a, a, a wait async method here. So check the distributed data first. If the key is there, return the cache data. If the key is not there, go ahead and set it there. So the cache data, what's the issue here? What issue do we have here? String to byte. So this is the byte, this is a byte, that, that's one thing about the um, distributed cache. So it's a byte type. So what we have to do here is that we have to deserialize it first because it's only taking a binary type. So I'm going to go ahead and use the JSON deserializer to deserialize it, uh, deserialize value. Uh, 
Uh, let me see if I have that library here. I might have to install Newt in JSON. So what I'll do is I'll go ahead and install another package, uh, which is the Newt in JSON package. Um, manage NuGet JSON. Just type JSON. That should bring out the most popular one. Newt in. Uh, so we have the Newton JSON. So that gives us the library to serialize and deserialize. Deserialize is basically, you know, converting from byte, byte binary array to human readable um, data, right? So, so I think I have that installed. So. so i have that so just to save time i will quickly um install it on the second server as well so we don't have to go through this when we get to there so json linkedin json install it there also So now we have it there. So, yes. So I guess we have it uh, installed in the second server as well. We can use the Newton JSON server there. Okay, so that's done. So moving forward, going back to the first controller, so Newton JSON convert. Uh, give me the access to the library. So the library let me convert and deserialize. So I'm trying to convert it from binary type to human readable deserialize object. And that is expressing a string value, but, it, but this is not a string value, this is a binary value, right? So I'll have to read it. Encoding dot utf8 dot get string so get the string value of this binary type so now once you get that then return it right but what if this is not there so there are several ways we could go about it actually but before we proceed i want to clarify um, one thing about the binary type that is something that comes with the inbuilt distributed cache library so if we actually check the uh, distributed cache library itself interface the get async we can see that it comes with a binary type by default of course there are several ways that we can of course um, make it accept generic type but that's a whole different implementation for now i will just explicitly you know encode it and convert um our type into binary array which i've done using the encoding so um here i'm not using the text file i will i would like us I will, I would like us to work with object so object i'll go ahead and create a new class uh let's create a new class here and we're going to call the new class uh class add class um class person student we just need some object to work with so create a new class Uh, we can name that um person or student i'm trying to come up with idea or oh, i'll just go with students anyway so let's work with student class so we add the class there in the student class i'll create several properties there uh, what properties could um student have uh we'll create that as Uh, let's do student name prop tap tap string uh, name and what else I'll just copy that create another property uh, the other property could be string uh, maybe subject um, I also create a third property I can name that uh, language or i'll just do nationality i guess let's let's do nationality so nationality so that's fine we can work with three pro properties for now so we've uh, we've created a student object here 
So I'm going to go ahead and close that. So here in the controller, I will create an object of the student class. Before we proceed, what I'm trying to achieve is initially we work with text file, right? Uh, reading the text and all that. So I'm trying to work with an object now because for the most part, we'll be getting object from database. So here I'm going to go ahead and create object of student class. Um, let's give that uh, var student is equal to new student. Then I can go ahead and uh, create uh, assign value to the student properties. So the names will be, let's give it James, Harry. Uh, we have subjects, let's give that a uh, system network, I guess. System network. And for the nationality, uh, I'll just assign that to, let's put Canadian, Canadian. All right, so we should be fine with that. So now if we get, if we check into the distributed cache, if we don't find the value, uh, I want to come get this value of student. And then what, after getting the value of student, I want to set uh, that value into cache. So we are checking distributed cache first. If it's there, this realize it. If it's not there, come get this value of student. And then this value of student object, I'm going to set it in the cache. So that way, what I'll go ahead and do is call the cache object. Uh, but then before I set it, I would like, I'll, I'll of course have to serialize it uh, into binary type. So we can also use JSON Newton converter for that. So serialize uh, JSON convert dot serialize object can actually make that work. So what we'll do is we'll just add the object type there. And then of course, uh, suspecting an object type, we just put the student object type there so it's going to serialize it for us into binary type because that is what the uh, set async method is accepting so we'll just call the set async method using the distributed level mod distributed cache object to call the set async so we'll assign our default key there since we don't find it in the cache serialize it and set it into cache so we are using set async so if you can see it is accepting the binary type as value so that's why we are serializing it into the binary type using the JSON convert, right? So moving forward, what we are going to do here is um, assign the key there. Then the value type, uh, we are going to encode it uh, into a binary type. then we also need to accept um we also need to add a third parameter there which is uh default i think it accepts uh, an object type let's see uh, okay we have to encode it first for it to actually accept it remember it's taking the uh, binary type so i'm gonna go ahead and do that get byte Uh, I'm not sure why we are still having this error there. Oh, I guess um, line 45, we've already serialized the student data. So we are supposed to put the serial data, serialized data there. Yeah, that should be the issue. But um, just let's just move forward and add the other parameters there. The other parameter is distributed cache options. So that is um, how long do we want the cache to stay in the, the value to stay in the cache memory. Um, this is an optional parameter though, but let's just assign like five minutes for now. That means if we keep the value in the cache after five minutes, it will expire. But if value keeps, if the user keeps calling the value every five minutes, it will keep renewing the five minutes. Uh, but it's an optional parameter, like I said, but let's just assign five minutes uh, to that. And then the um, cancellation token, I'll just put default there. Um, we really don't need that, but just to satisfy the parameters in uh you know in the sets config set async rather so i'll just put default there and i think uh we should be good to go on that aspect and then what i'm gonna go ahead and do now is to just copy the uh serialized data value into the get async get get byte rather 
So that has clearly, uh, you know, the error we're having there since we serialized the student data already. So that's what we need there. And uh, moving forward, I'm going to go ahead and run the application now just so we see how that works for us on the distributed uh, cache. Let's just wait for the server to come up. I mean, it might take a couple seconds or maybe more. And there we have our application coming up. I'm expecting uh, by the time it comes up, I'll input the key there and that's, that should hit the debugger. So here we have our application, the first server, first controller. So I'm going to go ahead and input a key there. Uh, let's just give that um, a random name, my key. So I'll go ahead and execute that. It should hit the debugger. So now, as we can see, it has already hit the debugger and we are checking the distributed cache server. So let's see what we come up with. So of course, it's coming up as a null value. If you check it is null value, there's nothing in distributed cache server. So since there's nothing, they go ahead and get me the student object, the object of the student. Serialize the object for me. You can see the object is a binary type. I mean, it's a human readable type. Then serialize it into binary type, right? So if we check the value now, it will be a binary type value. So it has been serialized, right? And then set it into the distributed cache. So then return the student object. Basically, that's everything we've done there. So now we have the student objects. We have James Harry Systems Engineer, uh, Canadian. So if I go ahead and run it again, then I will be getting the value from the cache. It doesn't have to travel all the way down to go and get it from the. You can see it's a binary type, right? Then we are deserializing it into human readable type, which is the serialized value. If we check the value there, it's human readable now. And then just get me. So it saves us the trip of traveling all the way to the back end to go and get the student data or everything from database. So this is coming from distributed cache now. And the beauty of this is even if I call this same key with another server, like another project, it's going to fetch me the um, data as long as the project is, you know, uh, serialized. So we just have to change that to a two string so we can read it because we didn't get the right input. Uh, let's run it again. And that should come up in a sec. So there we go. I'm going to input my key and then my key will go to the cache memory and fetch me the data. Get it from the cache. There we go. It's available in the cache in binary format and then deserialize it into human readable and then to string so I can read it from the front end. And since we've done all that now, we should be able to have our data there, which is human readable. We see that is coming from the distributed cache. So we actually have that work. So if I go ahead and try this my key in another server, then definitely it will work. So I'm going to go ahead and use that same my key in the uh, server two, right? Set that as a startup project. I'm going to go to the controller and, um, you know, configure the whole thing that I did there. Uh, let me try and copy everything that I have there as a distributed server. Let's copy that uh, into the, so we can save some time. Oh, I'll just write it. I guess I'll just, I'll just type it fast. Um, so let's, Put the private i distributed cache there set the object same thing with the same thing we did in the previous server right so we'll put that there configure everything there let's do that real quick injecting it 
so here i don't even need to like create the object of the student in this server i'm just going to depend on the key of the server so this second server doesn't have to worry about going all the way to the back end to fetch any student's object or anything so i'm just going to use the key to fetch it from the distributed server so see how that saves us some code and also save us some time and also the server load so if we have even more 50 servers in the solution they can just use the key and get it from distributed value so i'm going to come here and call um the distributed cache object to get the key from the distributed cache server uh, memory rather So if you notice what I'm doing here, I'm just calling the key. I'm not even worried about creating a student object or writing any code to go and fetch the student's objects. I'm just depending on the key. And I'm going to go ahead and run this server now and see if we can get the key. Of course we will. Uh, one thing is because it's actually a binary type, so I might have to deserialize it. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, stop that. So we we have to deserialize it before we can actually read it because the binary type is not human readable. So what I will do here is come back and deserialize the value. So if the cache is not null, let me just copy the deserialization code here just to save time. Uh, I'll just go ahead and copy that. So deserialize the value, then come back to the second controller. I'll just put it there. So then return the deserialized value. I'll import the JSON convert library there. import Newton JSON as well as um, encoding system.txt. So what I'll do is to return the serialized uh, value, right? Return the serialized value. I mean, the serialized value rather. So because it's coming as a binary type, I want us to be able to read it. So I'm going to deserialize it and then present it as a toast string. So it will come out as a string value. So we can see how we structure this now. The second controller doesn't have to get an object of student or anything it's just depending on the key so what i'm going to do next is to run both server at the same time right click properties and run as multiple projects right then i'll start both projects at the same time okay apply so if i run the start it's going to start both server for me at the same time let's see how that works So we have both servers coming up. We have started both server at the same time. So you will see the first controller and the second controller. Let's just wait for it to come up real quick. So we have first server which is cache project and the second server which is test server so we have the first controller and the second controller so i'm going to go ahead and input my key there so execute it so it's hitting the debugger right then execute it so now i'm getting the value i'll be getting the value from the distributed cache let's check what we get from the cache memory uh, just run through that real quick so now if i check the value i'm getting it from the cache memory james harry and all that right i'm going to run the same key on the second server remember the second server don't even have the student object but it's just depending on the key let's run it there and see what we get back 
so the second server is also getting the same value so even if we have up to 50 or 100 servers they can all use the distributed memory cache as long as they have access to the same connection string and the same key so this has actually make our cache memory distributed across multiple servers and this is the beauty of distributed server so a lot can be done with this actually we can create a library for multiple projects to actually consume the distributed cache server and it's really useful and um a lot of optimization might be done to it it makes system faster it makes object more accessible it reduces less load on server it reduces round trip on server and a lot of things can be done with it but we have one issue now what if um we have data integrity issue whereas if all the servers are depending on the distributed cache and then something change um in the database how do we go about that but that's a topic for another day this is just to show how distributed cache works in dotnet core and dotnet 5. and that's it for the distributed cache now we see how we can use multiple servers to consume a distributed cache also we've seen how we can locally utilize our local memory cache for each server but then there's still a concern for this because this whole cache thing ensures that a uh, system is optimized and they will get a copy of data from database and we store it in the cache but what if the original copy in database what if the value has changed what if the customer made an edit to the value there maybe if the value there is like um for example five and then there's a change to it like three but the cache memory still has five in it and the customer keeps getting five meanwhile there's a change in database so this could be a disaster right there's no data integrity we need to ensure that Whatever we have at the back end is in sync with what we have in the cache. So this process is called cache invalidation. In my next video, I'll be looking into several ways we can invalidate cache and sync it to what we have, what we have in the database. So customers or users will still be getting the same value from cache at a faster pace and still with data integrity, meaning that whatever is in the database is always updated in the cache. So there are several ways to implement cache invalidation. Please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe so you can get notified when I put up my next video.